know what people say, criminal lawyers see bad people at their best, divorce lawyers see good people at their worst. Noah Baumbach's marriage story finds love in a hopeless place. This tale of two people legally dissolving their union I want to talk about it as us. Who the f is us? takes care to honor the good things that remain between Adam Driver's Charlie and Scarlett Johansson's Nicole, no matter how angry and hurt both feel. Honey, let me finish. Sorry, I keep saying that. Ultimately, the movie's title tells us everything. This isn't a divorce story. It's the story of a marriage as a whole, told from the vantage point of its final days. I wanted the movie to, to be a love story. The film begins with the couple describing each other's most charming traits. Nicole gives great presents. She's always inexplicably brewing a cup of tea that she doesn't drink. Charlie is undaunted. He's very self-sufficient. He can darn a sock and cook himself dinner and iron a shirt. And ends with a gesture of one taking care of the other reminding us that, as parents to their son Henry, they'll always be family. As you come apart, you're reminded that this is a person you had great feeling for, and maybe still do in many ways. The result is the rare divorce narrative that feels for both characters, and after grieving what they've lost, makes us feel optimistic about their separation. Because these two people, who do love each other, don't belong together. And that's okay. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. Baumbach has emphasized that Marriage Story is not autobiographical. You know, there's a distinction between personal and autobiographical. But it's also clear that the movie is deeply informed by the filmmaker's own personal experiences and feelings. Philip Roth has a great quote that he takes two stones of reality and rubs them together to spark the imagination. The story bears overt similarities to Baumbach's relationship with his ex-wife Jennifer Jason Lee. Like Nicole, Lee is an LA-born actress and the mother of Baumbach's firstborn son, who at nine years old is now close to Henry's age in the film. Henry's eight. Even though Baumbach and Lee divorced when their son was an infant. When the couple separated, Lee moved back to LA while Baumbach stayed primarily in New York, echoing Charlie and Nicole's cross-country divorce. We need to make an argument you're a New York-based family. Well, we are. Otherwise, you'll probably never see your kid outside of LA again. Lee shot to fame when she starred in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Don't bite. <laughs> which seems to have inspired Nicole's breakout role in a college movie. You might as well get what you paid for. After that movie all over the girl, she could have stayed in LA and been a movie star. Charlie and Nicole's relationship as director and actress She's my favorite actress. echoes Baumbach and Lee's collaborations on movies like Greenberg and Margot at the Wedding. I let you in! God damn, dude, you're such an asshole! Baumbach is also a child of divorce, and in 2005's Squid and the Whale, he examines divorce from the perspective of the kids. I've got you Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday, and every other Thursday. Every other? That's how we each have you equally. That was your father's idea. Now in Marriage Story, he revisits it from the point of view of the parents. Getting divorced with a kid can be one of the hardest things you'll ever do. It's like a death without a body. This feeling of a death or a severing is emphasized in scenes where the two feel pulled or are visually cut off from each other. There's a notable difference in how much Baumbach's view of divorce has evolved between these films, presumably in part because he's now been through one himself. Squid and the Whale has a dark view of patriarch Bernard as an arrogant egomaniac and focuses on how the kids are deeply scarred by their parents' separation. Has uh, anything been going on at home that might have provoked this behavior? Well. Bernard left him behind for three days last week. Marriage Story is far more optimistic, framing both Charlie and Nicole as good parents and suggesting Henry will emerge more or less unscathed. Ultimately, the movie's basis in real experience, both Baumbach's own and those of people he knows, leads to a story that feels chillingly universal. Anyone can see something familiar in this portrait of how love coexists with conflict, hurt, and even hatred all for the same person. I can't believe I have to know you forever! Marriage Story isn't just one story. It interweaves a number of narratives about this marriage. 
The film opens with lists of what's lovable about each person in the other's eyes. He loves being a dad. He loves all the things you're supposed to hate. Then we start hearing the couple's conflicting narratives about their family's home and future. We are a New York family. That's just a fact. Eventually, we watch the lawyers twist these narratives. So you got married here. Your kid was born here. And she served you here. Yeah, but we lived in New York. We're going to have to reshape the narrative to create dark, damning portraits of each spouse. She confided in Charlie one night recently, having just carried Henry to bed, that she was having trouble standing while walking down the staircase. You see it in thrillers all the time, all the stuff that seemed innocent in the beginning. You know, he touched the wine glass, we have the fingerprint, you know, what all those things that suddenly become part of the police investigation. I thought in a funny way that's also what happens in a divorce. But in the end, the movie comes back to Nicole's list of things she loves about Charlie, as if to declare that this is the true story of their marriage. And I'll never stop loving him, even though it doesn't make sense anymore. On-screen divorce narratives frequently pick sides and focus on the vitriol to the point that the couple's entire past is shaded with regret. But Marriage Story is the rare example that fights fair and prevents us from blaming one spouse as wholly at fault for the split. I had a kid from my ex and a narcissistic artist and verbally abusive. But Charlie's not terrible. From the start, the film brings us into both Charlie and Nicole's subjectivity. The camera foregrounds each person's emotional experience. Cinematographer Robbie Ryan is most known for 2018's The Favorite and for his collaborations with Andrea Arnold, which also ground us in her character's subjectivity. And one of Bombach's visual inspirations was the faces in Ingmar Bergman's persona. The fake newspaper article we see also alludes to Bergman's Scenes from a Marriage, another intimate psychological portrait of a marriage coming undone. Ironically, the visual focus on what each character is feeling draws our attention to how their spouse isn't seeing that. There's universal truth in this. Often when couples are struggling, they're feeling similar things and maybe closer or more in agreement than they think. But lack of communication causes hurt and animosity to spiral out of control. One thing that was very important to me was having this line here in the middle of the space. That way when he's here talking and she's, you know, standing over here, you have two people who can't see each other. The film captures how easily conflicts can snowball into a terrible mess even when both parties have good intentions. And neither has done anything awful. When Johansson gives her major monologue to Laura Dern's hotshot divorce lawyer Nora about why the marriage went wrong, Nicole's reasons for divorcing Charlie are valid and inspire sympathy, but they're hardly evidence that he's the devil incarnate. He truly didn't see me. He didn't see me as something separate from himself. Except for one thing. At the very end of her monologue, Nicole says, Also, I think he slept with the stage manager, Marianne. The f Asshole. Confirming what the movie hints at earlier, when Nicole reacts intensely to Marianne speaking to Charlie, and he tries to pacify her by leaving their own party early. Briefly, it might seem that the story is giving us our cue for who to condemn. Cheating is the textbook bad husband behavior that narratives use to get us on the wife's side. But when we get more context a little later, this one-time infidelity after their marriage was already on the rocks yeah. after I was sleeping on the couch. Was bullshit about working on us is at most a catalyst or a symptom of what was already wrong, not central to why they're separating. After giving Nicole this early advantage by letting her air her grievances and tell her side of the story, the film shows more of Charlie's suffering as he's isolated and torn down by the divorce process. Given his growing fears of becoming alienated from his son, and the way he's forced to give up time in his beloved New York for LA, a city he hates, he is the bigger loser in the situation. New York is a long way from here. Oh, well, we like it because we can walk. You can walk here? Not really. And the space. Charlie's two Halloween costumes symbolically announce his emotional state. The first year, he feels like the invisible man, and the next year, he's become a ghost you could easily miss in this frame. These costumes reflect the pain of feeling like he's no longer as central in his son's life, like he's being partially erased, just as, over the course of the film, he's removed from the family portraits on the walls of his son's primary home. And at your mom's? At home, I have most of my toys, 
There's a pool. And this reflects one of the most terrible results of divorce with a child, the loss of being a full-time parent. But if he stays here and I stay in New York, it's just that I won't, I'll never get to really be his parent again. Some viewers expressed the opinion that the movie ultimately sides more with Charlie, but in reality it simply shows feeling for them in different ways. Giving more weight to Nicole's reasons why Charlie fell short in the past, and more screen time to Charlie's present pain. The ultimate message that the movie gets across is that so often in relationship breakdowns, no one is truly wrong. But that still doesn't make anything right. I feel like maybe things have gone too far. Uh huh. You know, it's common that people meet with as many lawyers as possible so that their spouse has limited options. Oh, I don't think she would have done it deliberately. You'd be surprised. In this movie where neither party is the bad guy, the one true antagonist is a bureaucratic system that seems determined to bring out the worst in everyone involved. This system rewards bad behavior. Charlie and Nicole try to begin their separation from an amicable, mature place. But the film illustrates that it's not possible to have a gentle divorce. Initially, it's the divorce lawyers, Nora and Jay, who seem to blame for fueling hostilities in their egotistical ambition to win. This is a street fight now. Nora even slips in a last-minute clause just to make sure Charlie's and Nicole's custody isn't quite equal. Take it. You won. Yet the lawyers' competitive winner-take-all mentality is really just a symptom of a larger problem. The system requires lawyers to resort to mean, immoral tactics to do their jobs well. We need to hire a private investigator. Really? I mean, really? Does your wife do drugs or anything? Charlie's first lawyer, Bert, is the rare exception who retains a human perspective. But this is precisely why Charlie has to fire him. You just transactions to them. I, I like to think of you as people. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> And not just you, her too. The movie also offers a commentary on how parents have to pretend to be unrealistically perfect to hold on to their kid. Nancy Katz, the woman who comes to observe Charlie's parenting, reflects a system that's designed to hyper-focus on potential flaws and risks. Some parents won't take their kids to a restaurant because of these super bugs. Instead of paying attention to the positive values of quality time with each parent. When Charlie accidentally cuts himself while doing the knife trick, this accident highlights the unnaturalness of being evaluated as a parent. Do you ever observe married people? No, why would I? And it also provides an apt metaphor for how Charlie's custody battle feels like bleeding out on the floor. Meanwhile, the way that Charlie and Nicole's behavior is held against them in the divorce proceedings illustrates that any mom or dad would look bad when put under such a paranoid microscope. Anything since you've been a mother? Hot a few times, Coke once at a party, I'm, Henry wasn't with me. Nora gives a standout monologue highlighting how, to this day, there's a double standard, especially when it comes to mothers. But people absolutely don't accept those same failings in mothers because the basis of our Judeo-Christian whatever is Mary, mother of Jesus, and she's perfect. In one of the most famous custody movies of all time, Kramer vs. Kramer, Meryl Streep's character comes off as the parent in the wrong for temporarily abandoning her child. But Marriage Story takes care to counter this bias that a good mother must be perfect. We can accept an imperfect dad. Let's face it, the idea of a good father was only invented like 30 years ago. Here, Nicole's desire to carve out a brave new life without Charlie is the right instinct. You're saying I want something better for myself. You do. The movie also acknowledges that Nicole isn't interested in stereotypically gendered expectations for mothers like cooking and cleaning, but in no way frames this as a failing. Instead, she comes across as a loving, engaged mom who values connecting with her son. She is a mother who plays, really plays. Overall, what the system creates and what makes this divorce go so terribly is distance. It doesn't work when Charlie and Nicole hide their true feelings from each other. I'm not gonna read this out loud. And put others in control of this process, as if it's happening around them, without them truly being a part of it. She said you'd take custody and everything if I didn't respond. It's better if we just let the lawyers do this. Yeah, but she's saying things I don't think you mean. It's only when the pair talk through and understand each other, even though that requires painfully exposing their wounds, Every day I wake up and I hope you're dead! That things turn around. This scene when Nicole comes to talk to Charlie and maybe try to find some kind of common ground, I felt like the story of this sequence 
which is about 11 pages in the script, it was the story of them trying to find voice. Ultimately, Charlie and Nicole need to take ownership of their divorce and do it together. It's up to anything? us. It's our divorce. It so ironically, it takes collaboration and goodwill not being at odds for them to negotiate the healthiest possible future for their family. A couple coming apart in divorce, but a family coming back together in a new way. As much as the film emphasizes the love between this couple, it also makes it clear that Nicole and Charlie are better off apart. Each expresses that the other holds them back. But if I suggested we do a year or something, he just put me off. I was hot shit and I wanted to fuck everybody and I didn't. There's also a damaging undercurrent of competition between Nicole and Charlie. He made fun of it and was jealous like he is. In the backstory, Nicole is the more famous one after her early movie career, but she loses status thanks to her choice to stay in New York as part of Charlie's avant-garde theater company. Meanwhile, his star rises, and while he says he appreciates the sacrifice she made, he seems content with her as the lower status spouse, as he won't consider spending time in LA or letting her try directing. At our theater, I always wanted to direct, and then Charlie would say something like, the next one, but he was always the director, so there never was a next one. Ironically, their opening lists name their competitive natures as something they like about each other. Are you kidding me? I was just in jail. God damn it. Stop She's it. competitive. He's very competitive. Who owns Baltic Avenue? Me. How much is it? I don't have enough. Okay, so I'm done? I'm done, right? That's it. The couple also has an unhealthy relationship with control. We're told Charlie was a controlling husband. Directed by her husband, supposedly very controlling. Nicole feels he regulated every detail of her life with him. All the furniture in our house, it was his taste. I didn't even know what my taste was anymore because I had never been asked to use it. And we see brief hints of this even after they're apart. Did you dye your hair again? You don't like it? No, I guess it's fine. Is it shorter? I prefer it longer, but... Uh, sorry, it's just absurd. This part of their relationship echoes their director-actress dynamic. These two are used to him directing her. Let's try it. Crawling, but also standing. Which fuels her feeling that she's always implementing his vision. I can tell you want to give me a note. Stifled by this power imbalance, Nicole is eventually overwhelmed by a desire to be the director herself, both on screen and in her life. But the best reason this couple shouldn't be together, the only reason that really matters, is that they don't actually want to be. I know you don't want the disruption, but you don't want to be married. Not really. In the couple's climactic fight scene, where they have it all out, Nicole says the problem is, You didn't love me as much as I loved you! And tellingly, Charlie doesn't disagree. What does that have to do with LA? What? He reveals that he actually didn't want to get married in the first place, and he long resented that he didn't get more time in his 20s to enjoy being single. And you wanted so much, so fast, I didn't even want to get married. Oh, it. There's so much I didn't do. <laughs> Thanks for that. You're welcome. Often divorce is framed as a desperate last resort, like you must need a dramatic reason to want out of a marriage. The only grounds for divorce in this state are absence of a spouse, incurable insanity, life imprisonment, or adultery. But isn't not wanting to be married reason enough? During the movie, the power balance shifts as Nicole blossoms from being unsure of herself. He's very clear about what he wants, unlike me, who can't always tell. Into a thriving, confident career woman. She got an Emmy nomination. <laughs> He's a great actress. Uh, no, for directing. While Charlie falters after winning his grant. But in the end, the silver lining is that both come into their own as a result of the uncoupling. Baumbach said her monologue and his song at opposite ends of the movie are mirror images of something. In a way, both of them find their voice. Their mirror journeys are reflected in the songs they sing from the Stephen Sondheim musical Company. Nicole performs You Could Drive a Person Crazy, You Could Drive a Person Crazy, which ends with the line, Bobby is my hobby and I'm giving it up. <laughs> reflecting her successful extrication from an affair that's been toxic for her mental health. And Charlie impulsively sings Being Alive, Being Alive, in which he rediscovers the need for love. Somebody crowd me with love. Despite Charlie's struggles, he needed this shakeup to rediscover his passion. Want something? 
want something. And ultimately, this moment is hopeful that there will be love again in his future. Somebody make me come through. I'll always be there, as frightened as you, to help us survive. Marriage Story counters our culture's habit of seeing every end as a failure. Partly what I wanted to say with the movie is that, that endings don't have to be failings and that we can still celebrate the thing for what it was, even if it's over. It underlines that the enduring connection of sharing a big part of your life with someone doesn't just go away. Charlie will have that. The Greek salad, but with lemon and olive oil instead of the Greek dressing. Okay. As Bombach has said, it can still be a love story even if they don't end up together. Some of the best love stories of all time finish this way. This movie about divorce is an affirmation of love in all its messiness, complexity, and impermanence. It's not as simple as not being in love anymore. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a streaming service we love. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film. Whether it's a movie you've been dying to see or one you've never heard of before, there is always something new to discover. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard-to-come-by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser-known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline. And there are no ads ever. One movie you can check out right now on Mubi is Sons of Denmark, which offers viewers a fascinating and provocative study of political violence. This 2019 thriller is part of Mubi's Direct from Rotterdam series, showcasing standout films from last year's International Film Festival Rotterdam. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.